It is Friday, April 2nd, let's talk PlayStation. Starting off, as always, with the PlayStation Plus lineup, you only have a few days left to grab the March titles before they go away, so make sure you do that. Come April 6th, it will change over, and we know what that lineup looks like. Oddworld Soulstorm is the PS5 benefit, which we actually knew about prior, but still great to see a brand new PS5 game launching on Plus. And then Days Gone is one of the PS4 benefits. Great game, of course, but... You know, we've seen this a lot with Sony. There's some uh, crossover here with the PS Plus collection, and they've done this prior with PS Now. And so, you know, a lot of people have had opportunities to play this game before, but if you're on PS4, don't have a PS5, don't use PS Now, this is your chance to probably play it now. And then Zombie Army 4 Dead War, great candidate for PS Plus. It's a well-received game, and it's one that a lot of people haven't had the chance to get to yet. And that, to me, is always some of the best games that you can actually offer on Plus. So, good month. I'm still enjoying the trend here where PS Plus, generally speaking, has been very good, and this is something that I hope Sony continues. Now, moving on to our first news story, Insomniac Games has recently patched the 2016 Ratchet & Clank remake to unlock the frame rate when it's played on PS5, meaning the game now plays at a full 60 FPS, and it looks very good. This is awesome news considering the game was just made available for free through the Play at Home initiative not too long ago. That actually just got taken down yesterday, so hopefully you picked it up while it was available. But yeah, it looks very good on PS5. I wish more developers were doing this for their PS4 games. Remember, this is not a native port to PS5. Rather, it's still the PS4 game played through backwards compatibility, and PS5 is just brute forcing the frame rate up to 60, assuming that it's uncapped. And that's where some games don't go past 30 because they have a hard cap of 30 FPS. So this was very welcomed. Next up, we are less than one month away from Eternal finally launching. And because of that, we're now seeing a lot more promotional material out of Sony, starting with a new trailer, but also a gameplay write-up over on the PS blog. I'm not going to go over everything, but here's some details that I've cherry-picked out of here that I found interesting, like the adaptive trigger support. So L2 will lock halfway down for a zoomed in focused aim that will highlight enemy weak points, and pressing it down fully will activate the alternate firing mode. If you keep the trigger pulled down after an alt fire discharge, you'll feel a low level vibration that steadily increases in intensity, matching the recharge cycle for that weapon. Your suit health and weapon proficiency will increase based on collectibles, which could be from enemy drops or unlocked chests. There's daily challenges with leaderboard rankings. You'll be given certain conditions on these challenges and only have one life to make your mark on the leaderboards. I like that idea a lot, actually. There's unreachable spots that will taunt you until you've found and incorporated the right alien tech to access in future cycles. Further exploration and backtracking will help you upgrade your equipment, unlock sealed sections, and delve deeper into the lore of the long-dead civilization. And passing through a portal into another part of Atropos seems as fast as walking through a door, so talking about the SSD stuff here, resurrections are also quick, a few seconds of flashback, and you reawaken at the crash site. So, I am still very excited for this game, and like we said, less than one month away, and I would hope that Sony continues their trend of doing a state of play one or two weeks prior to the game actually coming out. That way we can get a more natural look at the title uh, with some extended clips and some developer commentary. And to Housemark's credit, they've been talking a lot about the game over on their YouTube channel. We're learning more, we're hearing more, but the gameplay up to this point has been interrupted by a lot of heavy cuts and that falls more in the promotional material, right? I wanna see what a typical run would look like, how far somebody could reasonably get, and I think an eight to 10 minute long state of play uh, would serve that purpose quite well. For our next news story, obviously the disappointing thing that we learned this past week was the confirmation from Sony that yes, the PS Store is closing on PSP, PS3, and PS Vita. Uh, we already did a separate video covering this news, all the details that you need to know, and more importantly, some games you might want to buy before these stores are actually closed. But as a reminder, those dates are July 2nd for PSP and PS3, August 27th for PS Vita. After those dates, you can't buy new games, but you can still access your download list for content that you've already purchased before, so that's kind of the deadline that they've set. And what's really annoying about all this also is that, well, prior to the official announcement, we also learned that the link for the old desktop site is also dead. So if you remember when PS5 came out, they changed the desktop site to only feature PS4 and upcoming PS5 content. But if you just follow the appropriate hyperlink, that could take you back to the old web store. And now you can't do that. It's totally cut off, doesn't work anymore. Uh, which is really inconvenient because some people saw this news and thought, oh man, I don't have a PS3 right now, but let me go grab some of these PS1 classics and then I'll buy a PS3 eventually. That way it's in my download list. Same with Vita or PSP. 
but now you can't do that, obviously. So you need the respective machine to actually make a transaction. We're at minimum PS3 because I believe that console can see, that storefront can see most of the PSP and Vita content, barring some discrepancies. But uh, yeah, that's really a, a huge pain. And one other not so great piece of information that we learned was the PS Vita's messaging system is getting cut off July 28th. So this was actually confirmed in the same email warning users about the store closure. And this was of course overshadowed, but come July 28th, PS Vita owners will no longer be able to send or receive messages. And to recap where we are in terms of PSN, uh, PS3 was actually cut off a few months back from PS4 and PS5 owners and also the new mobile app. You can see the hard cutoff here for the network infrastructure and services where it's PS4, PS5, mobile app and up. And then everything below that, of course, we're seeing a gradual rollout or a gradual phase out of all these services and store features. Obviously, it's disappointing, but it truly is the start of the end of that era, so to speak, if it wasn't already obvious from what they've done up to this point, which we could easily do a separate topic on this, going over how they've handled the whole thing, you know, the idea of game preservation, but really what's so infuriating about this is our next news story. It's been well documented since the Monday announcement that Sony was not telling developers about the store closure, as in they learned the same day that consumers did. That's very problematic for the smaller teams that are still continuing to ship games on these platforms. Now, you can't publish on PSP and uh, PlayStation 3, it's possible, but most developers nowadays if they're releasing, they're doing it on PlayStation Vita of all things. So you're actively working against the the very the very community that's still supporting your abandoned platform at this point. I understand Sony walked away from Vita, they can't keep it going or, or what have you, right? But this is this is ridiculous. Why were developers not warned about this? Especially because the people that are shipping on Vita are smaller teams, two, three people, sometimes one person, and they're actively going out of their way to release on Vita because they're using older, well, a lot of these teams are using an older version of Game Maker, which that code is not easily moved to say, publish their, their game on Switch or PS4 or what have you, right? So a lot of teams are spending extra time just so they can release on PlayStation Vita. And now we're seeing cancellations or some developers actually saying, oh, I gotta try and crunch so I can get this game out for it being on the store for how many weeks, maybe a month if that, it's just, yeah, this really was, I saw this and I was like, oh, come on, are you kidding me? Especially because they could easily reach out to some of these teams that they know have dev kits or that they sold a dev kit to very recently. That's also on record. I can't believe this is actually, this goes at complete, this is at complete odds with how Sony has been preaching their love for independent developers. I mean, sure, Sony's gonna be a lot more forthcoming with developer support on PS4 and PS5, but at minimum, you need to be telling all developer accounts this or at least those with Vita dev kits that, hey, here's a five, six month notice before the public knows, and then that's an additional three, four months before the store actually closes, which is ample time for any team to make the decision of, okay, do we move this code over? Do we cancel? Do we continue to publish? It's just, it's a respect of that developer's time, energy, their business, and their livelihood, which did not happen here, and it's incredibly disappointing that that's how Sony's handled this and we also are hearing from the gamer.com the original source of the what was a rumor of the store's closure that some larger develop, developer accounts were made aware of this so we, this is either a, a massive oversight or favoritism or whatever but clearly this was not handled properly and i just feel bad for the developers that have to clean up this mess or make up or make a decision on what they want to do with their projects right now now, moving on to our next story, and it's still not good news, but we did see this coming in all fairness. We've got more departures from Japan Studio. So recently, Shunsuke Saito announced that they're leaving. They were art, animation, design on the Gravity Rush franchise. And then Gavin Moore, he was the director of Puppeteer, also producer on the Demon's Souls remake. He recently sent out a tweet. After 24 years at Sony and 18 of those in Japan, yesterday was my last day at Japan Studio. It's disappointing that Sony's letting a lot of this talent go and not finding some way or at least offering a relocation package of some kind to work at another Sony team or department because um, this really was a case of them not renewing all of their work contracts in Japan. That's how it works there. And uh, well, I mean, context is everything though. It's not super easy to move these people around. They might have family, friends, things like that, um, a house in Japan. So it's not you know, it's not that easy to put them somewhere else, especially because there only is one team there now, which is Team Asobi, but 
Still disappointed that so much talent has left. Although we did find out just yesterday in a press release on SI.jp that Nicholas Dessette, who is the director of Japan Studio, he's changed his title to the director of Team Asobi Studio, which makes sense, but this would imply that we might not see the Japan Studio labeling anymore. It depends on what that next Astro game really looks like. But we do also know that there's still two external development directors in Japan past this expiration date of a lot of these contracts. And also the same press release confirms what we were told prior, which under PlayStation Studios, it says, transfer the external development department directly under PlayStation Studios. This doesn't directly state that the department is dissolved, but rather it's working under the global brand, which we were expecting, right? So there's XDev in Europe, but we have this department in Japan, which we've seen a lot of collaborative works out of uh, for quite a long time now. So, you know, it's certainly been downsized to a degree, I would imagine, but um, we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out in terms of the naming for Team Asobi, but also uh, this department, and if we'll see more projects out of them in particular. But it should go without saying that Sony's still going to be heavily involved in external development in general for their IP or IP that they fund, and they'll have ownership of that too. Next up, we recently learned from the Directors Guild of Canada that The Last of Us HBO TV series will begin filming this year, July 5th, in Calgary, Canada, and it will run until June 8th, 2022, so quite a long production time slot, nearly a year, uh, meaning it'll be quite a while before we see what the first season of this show actually looks like. I'm assuming that's all for the first season. They only order ordered one, uh, but I'm guessing this is to accommodate for reshoots and... Uh, very lengthy episodes, maybe for the change in seasons, um, because it's running a whole year, but, you know, it'll be a while before we see, uh, what this looks like, uh, but at the very least, we should get the Uncharted movie February 2022, barring any sort of, uh, major changes or pandemic, because we know that principal photography on that has actually wrapped, so that is in all likelihood actually coming the date that they say it's coming. Moving on to our next news story, this past week we actually got confirmation of two next-gen PSVR games, which is pretty notable. Uh, so Pavlov is one of them. The founder and CEO of Bankrupt Games confirmed on Twitter, responding to a fan, that it's coming to PSVR 2, not PSVR 1, doesn't have the fidelity for Pavlov. And Lo-Fi also got its formal confirmation over on Twitter, Lo-Fi coming to PS5 and PSVR 2. Now if you remember, we actually talked about this game uh, last year, early last year, it was a while ago, but it was the same situation. It was on Twitter or something like that, but it was implied that it's coming to the next gen headset and not necessarily the current gen one. And well, all of 2020 and a little bit of late 2019, we were, we had some murmurings and things like that in the dev community and from PlayStation that, yeah, the next headset was coming and it was for PS5 and all that stuff. But still exciting to see our first, uh, small round of game announcements and we already know that Sony's sending out dev kits and prototype controllers. So I'm just wondering what the timeline really is for this headset. Could we see it in 2022 or is it further out 2023, the same timeline we saw for uh, the current headset on PS4. Now, moving on to CD Projekt Red, they recently put out a pretty large patch for Cyberpunk 2077 to fix a lot of the issues with the game. They're still not there 100%, but they've been making some good progress and really, we're just waiting for when this game will return to the PlayStation Store because it's been it's been three months now, which is pretty nuts. But the minor update that we have here is from the Senior Vice President of Business Development, where during an earnings call, he was quoted saying, We have published several patches. We have just published a really big one yesterday, and we have published several hot fixes. Each and every one of them brings us closer to going back to the PSN Store. However, the final decision you have to understand belongs to Sony. We do believe we're closer than further, but of course, the final call is theirs, so let's wait and see. It is still pretty nuts to think about how this actually played out. Sony getting upset with how the game launched, having to kick it off their store, uh, making an exception to their refund policy so they can appease the customer, which, you know, it's kind of good, but also it says a lot about Sony's original refund policy. And now we're three months later and the game is still not back on PSN. It's just, it's, it's bizarre. For our next news story, Kotaku published a very interesting interview with the studio director of Media Molecule, Siobhan Reddy, about the future of Dreams, what's going on with content curation in Dreams, or Sony's own investments in the studio, because that is a concern here, and there's certainly a lot of pessimism surrounding Sony lately with, you know, the whole Japan Studio situation, or backwards compatibility, and honestly, for a long time, I was looking at Media Molecule going, 
I hope nothing happens there, but Dreams just does not have that wide reach. Well, anyway, in this interview, Siobhan was quoted saying, we're on a big recruitment drive right now because to make the progress we want, we need programmers and we need designers. What really excites me about all this is Sony's really behind what we're doing and are investing in the studio to grow. Now, the big thing that Siobhan acknowledges here is that they've actually assigned people to content curation in Dreams. That way, the good original stuff gets put in front of you versus what we saw when the game came out where you had a lot of the unoriginal based on other IP stuff at the forefront or maybe it was a small comedic experience which was fine and certainly fun it helped with the word of mouth of the game but at the same time there were really cool experiences that people were making and they looked they resembled full-scale games or these crazy high resolution environments that just looked gorgeous and that was what was so exciting about Dreams originally, and this ties into what we saw or what we heard about back in 2018, which is these tools are so robust and fleshed out that creators could eventually make a full-blown game and potentially even publish that outside of Dreams and monetize their efforts. That might sound a little bit polarizing to pay for content that was say made in Dreams, but the one thing you have to remember is that if there's financial incentive, you know, people are already doing incredible things for free in Dreams. If there's financial incentive, you're actually going to see a lot of people uh, form small groups and teams to create what will be these full-blown experiences that can rival, you know, other independent studios or even, you know, an AA production type of game. It really is. That is what you can accomplish in Dreams. You just have to try it for yourself. But I'm actually quite pleased to see that Sony is going all in on this on this project. The only thing is it's still something that nobody's talking about, that Sony themselves aren't really giving them much attention. It seems like Media Molecule is doing a lot of their own PR, which is expected, but at the same time, you want support from the big publisher when it comes to getting the game out there. Um, I would hope there's gonna be some sort of a bigger marketing push eventually for this, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Next up, nothing too crazy here, but Project Athia, which we now know is called Forspoken. We recently got a, a small scene from the game, and well, now we just got an extended clip, which doesn't show us a whole lot extra. However, the video description, it says we should expect more information this year, which might tell us that the timeline for this game is sooner than we're thinking. I mean, this is what's so tough about a game that on the surface looks like it was announced really early. Maybe it's actually scheduled for early 2022, if we're being optimistic. Uh, I know we're always weary with games that are announced that far out and that they're also from <laughs> Square Enix. So, you know, maybe this is something where based on the information that we get later this year, it'll give us a better idea of just how far along this game actually is. Now, with all that out of the way, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus. The weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about with you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video, like we mentioned earlier, was the PS Store closure, all the details, and some personal recommendations and kind of a buying guide for what you might want to focus on before the stores actually go away. And as always, stay tuned for this coming Tuesday for another random video. Well, really, that one wasn't random. That was more relevant. But this coming Tuesday will probably be random pending any major announcements from Sony that we might want to talk about right away, which we'll always do if that is the case. But... That's it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.